Welcome back, everyone. Um, I will tell you a little bit of the procedure here. So we're going to do a moderated discussion. Hopefully it will be a lot of fun. We'll ask some tough questions for about an hour. And then um, at 3.30, we'll open this up for broad questions, both in this room and there's an overflow room. So if you are watching this on the overflow room, please give your questions to Michael, and they will come forward as well. Um, I will start and kick off in terms of moderated questions. What I'm going to do is ask one country, one individual on this panel, to sort of anchor a response. And then others, if you really feel compelled, can also join in on the answer. But we don't want to get bogged down and have this be you know, 20 minutes on one question. We want to sort of move through different questions. So I will designate one person as sort of the key person to answer the question. and then. You know, honestly, if you feel like you have a really important point, please, please join in or disagree with each other. We'll just kind of see how the conversation goes. So to kick it off, I will ask our Russian friend about the um, acronym versus cohesive group. Because you started some of your comments saying uh, the BRICS are not about the economy. It's a geopolitical group. And so I'm really curious how you think about the BRICS as a group. There have been three summits, the latest of which uh, just occurred in April in China. Uh, is this really a valid group, and how should the world perceive this group as an economics group, a geopolitical group, et cetera? Mm. It's so somewhere in between. It's not just an acronym anymore, but it's not a, a structure. It's not, it's not a political organization uh, yet, at least. Uh, I think uh, if we try to look at, at uh, BRICS uh, uh, as, as an economic um, entity, as it was designed initially, uh, then we will not arrive very, very far because, because the obvious differences, obvious uh, uh, differences in even in trends of developments, <coughs> Russia is certainly not... Uh, uh, that kind of uh, country which can be compared to China on economic development. Uh, Professor Singh was very uh, uh, convincing in describing li uh, India's problems. And uh, uh, it simply does make sense to try to look at BRICS through the economic prism because then we will see uh, uh, structuring or division of this grouping in t into subgroupings and then, then the whole idea disappears. But in terms of uh, political and geopolitical, uh, of course it's not, uh, it's not something uh, cohesive yet. More than that, I'm not sure that it's, it's uh, simply possible to make it a cohesive group. But this is really a manifestation of a multipolar world which uh, used to be an ugly uh, notion uh, uh, here in the United States 10 years ago. But now even President Obama is talking all the time about multipolarity. And multipolarity means that, that uh, it should be uh, new uh, uh, structures to try to, uh, uh, to understand different views and try to combine them. Because as we see, unfortunately, United Nations Security Council is not that, that, that body yet. And even when uh, uh, you, UN Security Council uh, legitimately votes for something and, and takes decision, as it was the case in Libyan, with Libyan war, the consequences might be quite again, unintended and strange. So I think it's very important uh, prototype of something new. Uh, and again, uh, what I said in my initial introduction, uh, the diversity of countries inside BRICS in this particular case might be an advantage uh, rather than a trouble. Okay. Um, so next question going to our Brazilian representative. What is the role of the BRICS vis-a-vis -vis other institutions? So vis-a-vis -vis the G20, uh, the G7, is it a counterbalance or counterweight to the G7 uh, within the World Bank or the IMF? Is there, is there a certain view of the BRICS on influencing those institutions? Uh, well, first of all, I think it's rather uh, interesting to see 
that four of the five countries uh, seem not to, well, actually say that they do not deserve to be part of BRICS, and the other one, China, uh, does not need BRICS to attain its <laughs> uh, foreign policy <laughs> goals. <laughs> so that tells us a little bit about uh, the nature and the necessity of this grouping. Uh, but, uh, and you look at pol politics, military, economy, demography, ge geography, and culture, all these traits, all these characteristics, they are very different in each country. And if we try to find a common denominator with those traits, we won't find one uh, at all. So what we have to look at, uh, it, do they share common interests? One thing is to uh, one thing is to say that uh, to criticize the uh, contemporary global order, saying that's too U.S.-led or based on the dollar, etc. Uh, in all these countries, I believe they have that mild anti-American or anti-unipolar or pro-multipolar uh, rhetoric. But to say that these countries share the same uh, uh, idea of what a multipolar world should look like in the economic aspect, environmental, and human rights, and so on. Very different, because you look, you ha we have, uh, uh, in this bundle, we have nuclear powers, non-nuclear powers. We have democracies, we have authoritarian regimes. We have uh, uh, con countries more pro-environment, clean energy, others not so much. Uh, human rights, so on and so forth. So it's quite dif difficult to find a common interest uh, uh, in that that uh, also uh, is an obstacle for the, this group to actually function in these uh, with G7 or uh, uh, G77 even or, or other uh, uh, other uh, the UN Security Council. We have two permanent members. You have others that want to become permanent members. So China, for example, has not endorsed Brazil's bid to this day. So that sh is but an example of, of the difficulties. Mm -hmm. And also, just wanted to mention that. And then, just to, to, to a as a final answer. Uh, what then unites these countries? What are the, the, you know, I was talking to my Russian counterpart, and corruption is, seems to be <laughs> one trait that unites oh. them. The <laughs> uh, a mild anti-American rhetoric, <laughs> also. Uh, but I would disagree with the Western part. If you go to Brazil and say br uh, tell Brazilians that they are not Western, I think they will disagree. Uh, there's a book <laughs> by a French uh, 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 political scientist, Alain Rouquier, uh, calling South America or Latin America the far West but still the West. So I'm not sure if South mm -hmm. Africa will feel the same to be excluded from uh, the West. Uh, so that's but an example also of how this grouping is quite diverse and fuzzy looking. Okay. Remember the sure, please. <coughs> uh, actually, if you really look at, you start doing categories and ask yourself demographically on various indicators of economics and various social indicators and you compare all these five not going to find anything very common. But what is true is uh, if you repeat something long enough mm -hmm. uh, and you have fora like you have here on a repeated basis all over the world, it takes on a reality of its own. Mm -hmm. And that reality is now here to stay. The problem, of course, is other countries will join it and this nice acronym may have to disappear. <laughs> uh, I mean, Indonesia may be in a short while Turkey for sure. Uh, so I think some other acronym might come into play. Uh, uh, you know, emerging, uh, uh, emerging powers or multipolar powers or whatever you care to call it. What BRICS is very useful for is that it allows these five countries, South Africa more recently, to talk about global agendas and prepare an alternative response to Western agendas. Uh, for example, uh, uh, on, on weather and climate change, on, on capping of carbons, uh, and on, say, agricultural subsidies uh, in the WTO. I mean, there would be no way of creating a cohesive challenge to, say, Japan, US, and Europe uh, when they throw in you know, billions of dollars of subsidies for the agriculturalists while third world countries uh, do not have a comparative advantage. This is, but it's free trade for, uh, for, <laughs> for, for others, but not for us. I mean, this is the US preaching all the time. So what this does, it, it is a group that allows alternative viewpoints, whether, you know, whether they're all the same or not, uh, to be cohesively presented. Uh, often India is chosen, uh, I think, for no other reason than that bureaucrats speak good English. Uh, 
I think this is here to stay because the reality becomes a reality. Uh, and I don't think we should try to do this, does it compare this way or does it compare that way? What it does compare with is that it's, it's a grouping that's there to stay and is based mainly upon good and prolonged economic growth rates. And other countries will join this grouping. Uh, in 10 years' time, the acronym may be there, but I think the group is here to stay. Okay, you wanted to add? So I, I, I wanted just to, to say it's, it's a very interesting discussion, uh, uh, Western, non-Western, but uh, what is the West today? That's, that's the key, key question. Is w US, Europe, and Japan same West as we remember from the Cold War time? Of course not. And the political West, which, which emerged in, in the Cold War uh, era, disappeared. The cultural West, which Brazil is part of and Russia is part of, is there, but it does not mean political, political unity. Okay, I'd like to ask our South African representative, um, what common values and interests do you think the BRIC countries, as they stand, the five, um, share? So China and India are often seen as manufacturing countries, uh, Brazil and Russia more as natural resource exporters, South Africa is talked about as a gateway to Africa in this uh, group. What, what do, are the strengths and weaknesses one to another? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, th I think in this uh, kind of gets us back to what we've just been uh, discussing, uh, particularly when you look at values and uh, not so much uh, uh, econ e economic resources, uh, but in, look in trying to get a handle on the coherence of the group or a lack of coherence. Uh, you you really have some major differences uh, in the sense that um, uh, Russia and China, for example, in, in particularly in terms of their uh, foreign policies, um, could be uh, characterized as uh, as norms and values neutral um, states in the way they um, are fixated on the application of non-interference uh, uh, and, and the, uh, 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 the non-interference cluster of uh, principles of uh, focusing on, on sovereignty, um, territorial integrity uh, is, is, is their default position. Now, to some extent, based on uh, on, on national interest on particular issues, um, uh, South Africa, Brazil, and India will uh, uh, w will uh, 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 take on those uh, positions as well. However, and 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 this is what is unique about the the IBSA uh, element of of BRICS is that IBSA was uh, was uh, launched as a a norms and values um, uh, coalition of uh, of regional democratic uh, powers in their respective uh, 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 continents, uh, which provides another cast to it. Now, this does not mean that they will always uh, uh, articulate those values um, uh, in international fora and there is often ambivalence in their positions. But uh, these are the kinds of tensions that you have within BRICS, which is why I do not see, I, I do not see BRICS evolving as a real geopolitical uh, uh, factor. I mean, it, it, will be, it may be geopolitical in the sense of uh, the way it conveys uh, its agenda or its agenda setting on uh, global economic governance. Uh, to me, I, th I think the, the, based on the norms and values um, tensions within BRICS, I cannot see the group uh, um, resonating beyond global economic governance. And uh, that in itself, however, is a, uh, is, is a, is a major um, area of dialogue that has to happen anyway and um, uh, you know which which will 
uh, which is taking place within the uh, uh, the G20, uh, and you know it uh, forms part of of a countervailing um, a cluster of 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 ideas uh, that can engage the West, the G7, the G8, and and for that matter, increasingly the developing countries, because you have another. Um, tension here between emerging powers and developing countries where uh, ad agendas are not necessarily the same and, and there is a sort of brittleness there uh, a, between the, the emerging powers and the global south and the developing countries. So uh, I, I think in terms of values and norms, I think that's how we have to look at uh, uh, BRICS at this point. Okay, uh, shifting to China and Professor Da, as the first person who will respond to this, I'm interested in other reactions on the role of China. Um, so it's been said that without China, the BRICS become brie. It's like soft, brie. bland cheese, um, not particularly powerful, not particularly um, strong, that China is really the muscle behind the group. And the Chinese know it. Uh, they have an effective veto power over any BRIC initiative. Without them, maybe the world wouldn't be paying as much attention. Um, and the Chinese economy is larger than the other BRIC economies combined. So question here is, what really is the role of China within this group? Uh, yes, uh, I think you described the uh, phenomenon that we, I think all the world and also we Chinese that uh, know, uh, know very clearly that China is, of course, the biggest economy among five members. And many people <coughs> think uh, that without China, this can, this group will become more or less, you know, meaningless. Uh, but uh, for for China, I think we know this fact, but we are very cautious about playing a leading role in this group. Of course, we are playing a very important role to that. Uh, I won't deny that. Uh, I think everybody believes in that. We, 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 we play a very important role and we, we really hope this uh, platform su uh, be successful. Uh, but we try to be an uh, equal partner, equal member in it. When I say an uh, equal uh, partner, equal member, I'm very serious, it's true. Uh, China really want to be an equal one among five because uh, uh, I mentioned that in my presentation, uh, one of China's intention in supporting BRICS, or one of the reasons why we like BRICS, is we are facing the kind of China threat theory for 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 decade for at least one decade, and uh, many country in the world, especially uh, Western countries, uh, have concern about a rising China, about China's strategic uh, direction. So we feel that um, if we, you know, we rise only by China itself, and also we try to, we call for kind of reform of international uh, institution, um, <coughs> you know, that could uh, uh, thicken the suspicion of outside world towards China. So we think that one advantage of BRICS is that we have several friends, we have several partners, we can sit down together and uh, try to coordinate our voice, our view, and express it, express it, or provide, uh, I said my uh, Indian colleagues' uh, uh, word, that alternative viewpoint uh, to the world, then China feel that, okay, uh, the pressure is not so big on, 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 on ourselves. So this is one thing. Uh, I think from our, you know, the reason why we support it uh, because we want to share that burden of uh, writing. Another thing is, uh, I mentioned that in my presentation is about uh, China's readiness in, you know, play, playing a bigger role, a uh, bigger role in the, on the international uh, stage. Uh, China, uh, though, of course, in uh, Asian history, China used to be a power in, uh, you know, at least in East Asia, but in modern history, China has never played a global role. So we really don't know how to play a global role, and we really don't know what kind of uh, international uh, order we want. 
So uh, several uh, those I think uh, other four members are more or less more experienced than China or more ready than China. For instance, Russia used to be superpower, so I think Russia. Uh, at least are uh, more ready than Chi than we Chinese to they they know better how to play a role, and for instance, uh, let's say uh, South Africa, Brazil, and India, and all these three countries, according to Western standard, they are democratic country, while China uh, is regarded not. So they know how to play the game in you know in current uh, international order and institution, they are, they are better than Chinese, than we Chinese to play this game. And also, for instance, Russia, South Africa, and uh, Brazil, more or less, they are part of uh, cultural West. Our uh, Russian uh, counterpart used that. So uh, they are more familiar with, because the current international institution, international order is dominated by the West. So they are uh, more familiar with that, mm -hmm. comparing with we, uh, Chinese. So we really think that, yes, we are quite strong uh, economically or physically, but intellectually and uh, psychologically, we are not strong, uh, maybe not strong as our uh, other, you know, four member states. So we want to be equal in this partner. Mm -hmm. We support, uh, in, in, in be an equal partner. So we, we, we support this uh, platform, but uh, probably in the short term, we won't play a you know number one leading role. You know we are one of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there other reactions to the role? Yeah, I have so. Just one quick observation about the very interesting debate on what's West and what's not West. Uh, of course, I'm uh, uh, cultural West. Of course, Brazil is a part of the cultural West. But in the case of Brazil during the Cold War, Brazil is also very much part of the political strategic West. Brazil has the uh, Inter-American tr uh, Reciprocity Treaty with the United States, the Defense Treaty. So, in, so not, oh, I'm not just uh, uh, emphasizing the cultural aspect of Brazil as being a Western uh, country of European descent, mostly culturally, uh, but also the political strategic in the case of Brazil that benefits to this day from uh, the strategic uh, Western Hemisphere uh, treaties with the United, arrangements with the United States. Oh, it used to be. Yeah. No, it's still it's still in place. No, but it's co Cold War is over, and all configurations no, from that time no, no, no. are senseless. No, no, I know, but still, but Brazil benefited throughout for decades. So to mention that Brazil Absolutely. is not part of the West, well, it, it, I'm not saying that's in the core of the West, but uh, it's certainly on the fringe. As two, if you look at, for example, two of uh, the Brazil's leaders always playing with the idea of not being so much in the core of the West being the fringe of the West. If you look at Brazil's uh, rhetoric, uh, official rhetoric, that term fringe uh, it, is, is quite often uh, used in the, in the 70s. And, and lately, you have the two former presidents, Fernando Henrique Cardoso and Lula, saying that, well, Lula and I, Fernando Henrique Cardoso said this, Lula and I, basically, we are in the same place, on the fringe of liberal order. The difference being that I'm on the fringe looking in, and he's on the fringe looking out. Uh, but still in the French. So uh, to say that Brazil is not part of the West, I mean, th it's a good debate, it's an anth uh, cultural anthropological debate, but it's still I believe that uh, there will be a lot of disagreements to say that it's not a Western country. Uh, Professor Singh. Yeah. I, I would like to make two comments. Uh, first is about the rise of China, it is correct economically. But good economists look at not only the benefits, but also the costs. So you're looking at an efficient path to development, you have to look at the cost-benefit ratio. Now, it is true that uh, China is about 10 years, 15 years ahead of China, of India, and unlikely that India will catch up to it. But it must also be part of the record that China killed somewhere between 60 to 80 million of its own people to get here. This is all thrown under the carpet because it's only the benefits that are counted. If you look at the costs, the tremendous suffering that the Chinese people have gone through, they must also be thrown into, into the balance sheet. And if you ask yourself, th there's, a, there's a new uh, idea that there's a China model to development. Uh, God forbid that the Chinese who execute more people than all the world of the combined should become a model. What is true is that the Chinese open <coughs> economic reforms should be a model for everyone. But the other parts of Chinese modernization cannot be called a model. The second part that uh, I want to make a point of, 
is uh, China has long thought of itself as the center of the universe. And the comment that if you took China out, the rest of the BRICS would disappear is an example of this sort of attitude. China, China is the center of it, <coughs> and the rest of you, I mean, India doesn't really matter, Brazil won't matter, Russia won't matter, South Africa doesn't matter. This is just not true. If China really wants to be an equal partner, it would have to change its own sense of history and its own sense of being the middle of the world. It may not be, uh, my colleague may not be aware, that if you go to East Asia, never mind the West, if you go to East Asia, they're begging, literally begging for the US to stay there. Singapore has actually built two large berths for aircraft carriers, which are large enough only for US carriers because China uh, wants to treat every other nation in East Asia only on a bilateral basis. Of course, being so powerful as it is, uh, militarily and economically, that's, a, you know, that's, not a win, that's just a win-win situation for China. So it objects enormously to open seas, open trade, and any involvement of the US uh, in these things. This is not an issue of international sovereignty. It's an issue of global treaties. And I think um, to say that China wants to be, have the advantage of, uh, of bearing a, a rather, wanting a rather larger global role. If any of these countries want a larger global role, they will have to share the larger global costs in treasure and lives. I don't see Chinese in Libya, I don't see Chinese in Afghanistan, and I don't see Chinese anywhere where human rights and the lives of people are there. It's always the Brits and the Americans who are dying. No matter what we say in terms of your perception of US policies, I don't agree with it many times, but it is easier to criticize. It's not easier to take on this global role. This will take a long, long time in Chinese perception to accept that. India too, it can't talk about being a global power if it does not want to take on many, many more global responsibilities. It does it, by the way, in UN peacekeeping forces enormously. So uh, I, I think sharing the burden at arriving there means also you know, sharing uh, the global costs of global governance. Okay, yes? Yeah, uh, uh, oh. mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, have to <laughs> I have to make some response. Uh, <laughs> I feel, yeah, I have this obligation. Yes. Sure. Uh, I think, yeah, I agree with Mr. Uh, Professor Singh's many arguments, uh, but still there are several things I want to uh, touch upon here. First is uh, about uh, so can, what, uh, China model or, or Beijing consensus, this kind of stuff. I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, I don't think... Uh, at least I think it's premature to say there is a China model or something. But I, and also of course, I won't say that uh, those people who died in uh, Great Leap Forward or Great Famine is, uh, you know, they, they, they need to die. Of course, that's a tragedy. But what I want to say is about China's uh, history uh, in recent, or in, we, w in China we call it in the first 30 years and uh, the second 30 years, First is from 1949 to 1979, and then the opening up and the reform from 1979 uh, to now. And the, the latter 30 years is 30 years of reform and opening up. Uh, but what we achieved in, la in the second 30 years actually is based on the first 30 years. I Wonderful. Of course, the, the cost is very high or too high, I would <coughs> say. But uh, but it's not to say if you want to achieve those, you have to die so many people. Uh, but it's very important to make China, uh, for instance, make our society more equal, make education more you know, uh, common in rural area, uh, make uh, everyone, uh, m average Chinese, the skill, the opportunity to, you know, to to be a skilled worker. I think you know, if we compare uh, the China's history, uh, China's experience, and uh, India's uh, ex 
history or experience in modernization. I think why we see something, just as Professor, you said, that it looks that China, I'm not sure if it's true, but it looks that China is 10 or 15 years ahead of sure. India. It's sure. because of those things that we achieved in the first 30 years. Actually, what we have done in opening up and the market reform, I think, are similar. Yeah, no, I think China's lessons on how to open up the economy, those are the ones we should follow. And why India is 20 years behind is because India started its reforms 20 years later. If you take the two growth curves, and I'm sorry I didn't show it, and you move India back this way, you'll see the growth rates, and you'll also see the trajectory of GDP almost matching. Uh, one almost screams, screams with horror at the half-baked reforms that the Indian government has carried out. But then India is a very fractious and difficult democracy. And that is something China can learn something from. Uh, one day, one day not far off, China will have to confront problems of freedom, free press, ability of individuals to talk, uh, to have representative governments. Then either the Chinese model will crack and the giant will fall into chaos, or it will have to learn from India. Um, Mr. Cornegate, did you have yeah. a comment as well? Yes, I, 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 I just want to say that I think a major problem in um, trying to understand BRICS uh, uh, is, the, is the fact that BRICS was, uh, has been so much associated with the hype. I mean, a, a, in a sense, it was, it was formed in hype. Uh, uh, you know, with the Goldman Sachs uh, uh, marketing of uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and, and China, uh, you know, for its own purposes. Now, <laughs> what these countries did is that they unwittingly bought into the hype uh, in launching themselves as a forum, obviously for their own national interest reasons, but nevertheless, they played into uh, uh, a... Um, uh, a, a Western script written on Wall Street. <laughs> and the thing of it is, is that if, if we, I mean, the very fact that Jim O'Neill um, is, is, is out of joint over South Africa being part of the group uh, is, is indicative of, of, of the tendency for the rest of the world to be defined either in Washington or Wall Street and w what we have to do is to um, uh, put some distance uh, on that tendency so that we can uh, look at uh, BRICS collectively and individually uh, in, 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 in proper perspective. Uh, otherwise, uh, so, so I think we have to leave the Goldman Sachs. We, we, we really have to, and particularly now that South Africa is a part of uh, BRICS, uh, 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 BRICS no longer conforms to Goldman Sachs and Wall Street. So I think what we, we, we have to do is to look at the, as where I think we're beginning to do in this discussion, is to really look at the dynamics within BRICS um, and the fact that BRICS symbolizes uh, where things have evolved in the international system uh, with, with, with the emerging powers. Okay, so uh, I appreciate that comment, and now I'm going to stir the hype a little bit uh, <laughs> with a Forbes report. So this question is coming to you, our Russia expert. Okay. Um, Forbes reported in March of this year that the BRIC countries for the first time surpassed the EU in the count of billionaires, the Forbes billionaires report. Um, it's a significant increase, and the question uh, to our Russian friend and others as well is how does this wealth accumulation in the developing economies affect internal stability or consumption patterns? Yeah, 20 years ago when transformation uh, in Russia started, everybody uh, or majority of people was very eager to see real capitalism in, in that country, exhausted by 70 years of socialism. Now we have it. And this uh, Forbes uh, uh, rating is just showing that uh, uh, every year the, the 
uh, amount of money which is uh, necessary to 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 become part of hundreds is growing mm -hmm. so when when they started this rating uh, five year, five or six years ago i think the the uh, was uh, around 600 millions or so was was enough to to be in the uh, lo low and uh, uh, in, in the bottom of, of of this list now it's uh, one and a half billions you need to to have to to be part of that uh, i wouldn't say that that affects uh, in russian case uh, i wouldn't say that affects a lot the uh, internal stability and uh, of course it's very unpopular but uh, public opinion is quite indifferent so theoretically everybody is furious but in practical terms everybody accepts that the problem in again in, in our case is that uh, uh, Forbes uh, uh, list shows basically uh, the level of monopolization of economy uh, a lot of uh, uh, participants in that list are from hydrocarbons industry, in a way, in one and another way associated with the state. Those who uh, uh, don't belong to the to, to that branch uh, and retail and so, but again, they used to enjoy some kind of mono monopoly uh, uh, status in their branches. And this is an uh, enormous problem, maybe not for social development, but, but for economic development in Russia. Uh, but uh, so far, I don't see any growing, uh, <coughs> what to say, protest against that. It's, uh, Russia is really the uh, most capitalist-minded country now than in, in the whole world. <laughs> okay, on um, Chinese Professor Singh. On demographics, so you talked about um, the demographics in India, and of the BRIC countries, India has the growing population of these five. Um, question for you about the rising new middle class. In terms of, you know, we've seen poverty rates falling overall, rising income has happened in these um, countries. Do you believe these trends will continue, and are the spending patterns changing? How do you think about this new middle class? Uh, first of all, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about India's demography, which is very different. Population is rising, but population rates are falling. Uh, the youth bulge is quite considerable. The percentage of people below the age of 25 is very, very large. Uh, thirdly, there's a massive change in the female to male ratio because of the preference for male children. This has terrible consequences down down the road for family structures and for the fact that oh, maybe 30 to 40 million Indian men, this is true in China too, will not have women. Um, there is also the question of massive urbanization uh, with megapolises. I think four out of the 10 largest cities in 2025 uh, in the world will be megapolises in South Asia. Uh, in India, it will be Delhi, Mumbai, and Calcutta. So these demographic changes uh, look silent, but they're the real aircraft carriers in the economy. Now, about the rising middle class, uh, it is true that maybe 14 to 15 percent Indians speak English. Well, that's 150 million people. It is also true that only about a third of India's economy can be considered in the middle class. A middle class, uh, I would define, and the Indian statistics define, as those who can buy white goods, that is, refrigerators, uh, electrical ovens, uh, things like that. But 33% uh, is still 335 million people in India, and that's a massive domestic market. One of the differences between in India and China is that if you look at the consumption as a part of the total gross domestic product, it's the same in the U.S. as in India, about 66%. In China, it's far lower. It's about 35%. China in investment is very, very high. So what India has is a built-in domestic market for consumer goods if it could only gin up its domestic manufacturing sector. And what's holding that back uh, are India's bureaucrats. I have said elsewhere that if India was to take all the bureaucrats and politicians and give them incomes in perpetuity with their children abroad, 
India would still gain and come out on top. <laughs> okay. Turning to our Brazilian representative, um, question on the expansion of the BRICS. So we talked about it uh, with South Africa, but I'm curious if there is a coherent view among the BRICS of um, what it would take to to have a new partner. I'm curious in your region about Mexico, but also um, Indonesia, Turkey, South Korea, et cetera. So what, what does this expansion plan look like? Well, if you add all those acronyms together, you get the whole alphabet. But uh, <laughs> uh, the problem is that, well, the BRICS made sense, uh, the Goldman Sachs report, and because of the name, BRICS, as, as meaning another <laughs> brick in the wall of the international system, et cetera. But if the first step maybe to lose that uh, pedigree is maybe to just switch the letters around and call it something else. But uh, the, pr the problem with expansion is that uh, I think it's limited, not only because of coherence, of ideas. I mean, w we see from this discussion that there's not a lot of a, a, co a common denominator. Uh, but the problem also when you begin uh, having regional rivalries inside the BRICS. Uh, the IBSA initiative, uh, India, Brazil, and South Africa, uh, was sustained, is sustained uh, uh, as an uh, uh, initiative of developing democracies. And these three countries, they emphasize that. So when they suddenly turn away from that initiative and look at the BRICS as this major thing, that kind that tends to diminish their the what they were emphasizing before as being democratic, uh, and developing in democratic countries. So uh, I believe that there are other countries that should be uh, should have a voice, uh, as Indonesia, Turkey was mentioned also. Uh, but I think uh, if you add if you keep expanding the BRICS. Well, we already have the G20 and financials. Uh, we have the G77 in the extreme. You know, just why not add them all? Uh, so uh, the problem, I think, what the BRICS is is not a policy center. The, it's not uh, a policy making uh, instrument. The BRICS is a symbolic instrument, sh the showing uh, the West, if I may say so, uh, that the world uh, changed. <coughs> that there are mul there are other poles of power. Uh, not necessarily uh, uh, equivalent, uh, and not that do not think the same thing. That there are regional orders that are not necessarily the same, uh, but that the world basically changed, and that major international institutions today they need to reflect that. Meaning the Security Council, but when but when you pinpoint, when you go down to the specifics, then BRICS does not exist. Mm -hmm. BRICS does not exist in the Security Council. Mm -hmm. The BRICS does not exist in the G7 plus Russia, as the name says. And when so on and so forth. So the BRICS is an initiative. The BRICS is a symbol. It's a symbol of change, but it's an empty symbol mm -hmm. of change. Uh, so if you add more countries to this mixture, you know it, it, you're trying to. It's tantalizing a uh, notion that you're trying to reach some something, a new global order, but you're not sure what it is. You're sure that what is not. It's not a Cold War order anymore. It's not West versus East. It's something else. But so far we have not. We don't have the answer. But maybe. The BRICS will, we may scratch the surface on the answer, but, you know. Or should, uh, should, no offense to my Russian friend, but should Russia drop out of the BRICS? That's also talked <laughs> about. Well, some people say that the BRICS should have, in Brazil, should have a, uh, a, a, not a capital B, but a small b, because Brazil, well, before South Africa, Brazil is the only non-nuclear power. So, as I mentioned before, when you have a grouping of five countries and four question their own presence in this grouping, <laughs> it makes, you know, it, it mm. shows you how, how frail, how, how fragile is this grouping. Uh, but I don't think Russia should, should drop. I mean, there are, s there are uh, common, some shared interests, but I think uh, 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 difficult to, to just pinpoint sure. what they think about. Uh, actually, the acronym doesn't have to change much either. If you add Indonesia and Turkey, you could call them brickets. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, back to Professor Da. Question about energy policy or energy relations. Um, each of the BRICs have major energy needs. Um, certainly, it, India often competes with China for resources elsewhere in the world, particularly in energy. But curious what you think the dimensions are of a um, national or international energy security strategy for this group of countries. <coughs> Uh, y yes, before uh, before talking about uh, energy, uh, can I say something about enlargement? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> following the uh, points. I think that uh, 
uh, I think all the member states are now quite cautious about uh, further enlargement uh, of BRICS, uh, not only ab uh, about these four letters, but uh, because, you know, uh, uh, I think there will be endless uh, discussion or debate in uh, among the develop developing countries that wh which country is, you know, more qualified into the uh, BRICS. So I think, um, you know, if we, we fall into this kind of debate, the, the it's endless. So the most important thing is, on the one hand, we need to solidify what we have together. These four countries are on the one uh, platform and also to 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 uh, strengthen our mutual uh, strategic trust um, rather than, you know, we sit down together and criticize to each other. And also open our door and dialogue with other developing countries, but not just bringing them in. You know, I, w I think that kind of uh, enlargement will make BRICS, uh, you know, uh, less and uh, maybe uh, more uh, irrelevant to the, you know, uh, international uh, economic and the political governance. And uh, to energy issue, I think um, it's also a uh, showcase uh, that uh, the BRICS country, I think one of the very serious problem uh, among BRICS country is that we don't have strat a very strong strategic trust. Or we have some problem there. I think actually there are kind of natural, uh, we could have kind of natural cooperation among our five members uh, as you, this mentioned that China and India, we basically, these two countries need energy, need um, uh, in, uh, materials, while uh, those uh, South Africa, Brazil, and uh, Russia are energy or, or, or resources uh, re enriched country. But still, uh, in, uh, in our uh, energy cooperation, I think there are some problems. Uh, for instance, between China and the Russia, and uh, also I think there are also some problems between China and uh, Brazil. So we have, of course, uh, energy supplier and uh, energy consumer have always have different, uh, different demands, different uh, interests. Uh, that's natural. But I do hope that if we five country uh, want <coughs> a stable, sustainable development, uh, I think uh, we. Uh, developing a kind of long-term stable energy cooperation is very critical for those five countries, not only for the energy and uh, um, energy and uh, uh, resources uh, consumer, but also for the supplier. I think it's very important. And uh, another fact is uh, energy security is for China, especially. <coughs> I think it's we we more and more re uh, realize that the uh, energy. Uh, new technology, energy uh, security, and also the, those those kind of energy saving uh, technology are very critical for China's future. So China invests a huge money in it, and uh, hope we can be a leading country in those new te new energy uh, technology. I think this is one thing uh, actually we five countries can do it together, and uh, we can also see that in the Sanya Declaration, which just. Uh, uh, issued in last uh, summit in, in Hainan, China. Um, but I personally a little bit worry about this kind of cooperation. I, I don't know if other four members have uh, strong, uh, especially those energy uh, supplier, uh, supplying countries, if they have strong uh, uh, driving force in their country to, to develop these new technologies with those consumers together. Okay, um, Mr. Cornegue, question for you that I understand was talked about in the last summit of the BRICS, and that is um, an alternative to the U.S. dollar. In terms of uh, monetary policy or currency issues, will the BRICS propose an alternative to the dollar? Hmm. Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a little outside of my uh, <laughs> specialty, however, uh, I, you know, I, th I think the short answer to that is is fair fairly clear. I don't, I, you know, uh, 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 the general commentary on that is that 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 is not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, um, uh, that none of the none of the BRICS uh, countries uh, uh, have have current currencies that 
are uh, at a level where uh, you can talk about an alternative uh, uh, in terms of their convertibility and and so forth. Uh, so, um, <coughs> y what you're what what you've got to be looking at for the foreseeable future is um, uh, what you currently have in BRICS, and that is a a trend towards um, trading within BRICS uh, uh, on utilizing uh, the currencies of the BRICS, BRICS countries. That's, that's where the focus is right now. Um, and this is not just happening within BRICS, but you do have among uh, some other countries, particularly energy producers w uh, that are, are, are like Iran um, and perhaps some others, that are trying to diversify away from the dollar uh, in in energy transactions. So you so you have those kinds of developments that are taking place. Um, in, in fact, what you may be looking at, uh, rather than the uh, uh, a new currency coming out of BRICS replacing the dollar, uh, you may be looking at a kind of a multipolarization of of regional currencies uh, you know for example uh, in in West Africa ECOWAS is talking about a, um, a, a, a a common currency for uh, West Africa it, uh, um, in southern Africa and and you know probably, uh, given the way things will evolve with the uh, with the grand uh, uh, free trade area, there will be uh, some uh, look towards a common currency for Eastern and Southern Africa. Uh, so I think these are the kinds of currency developments that you're going to have. But for the foreseeable future, uh, in in spite of uh, um, uh, America's uh, economic problems and so forth. Uh, Re replacing the dollar is a, uh, you know, is just not, <laughs> it's just not on the radar screen at this point. Uh, uh, other than what is in the media, uh, in in you know, l looking at these issues. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think people aren't aware as to what common currency means and how to create a common currency. First of all, nobody's going to hold a ruble or a rupee uh, right now. Uh, nor a rand, uh, even if it's backed with gold because they don't have enough global currency use. The only currency uh, which rising power would be yuan. Uh, China de kept its yuan devalued by about 20-25 percent, uh, playing WTO rules because it took exemptions for that, and they have increased their exports as a result of that. Uh, not just an unfair advantage for developing countries, uh, for developed countries, but also cut into exports for developing countries. So the question is, China, which has worked very hard to keep its yuan devalued, if yuan became a currency, the yuan would go through the roof. Secondly, it is not possible uh, to replace the dollar because trillions of dollars are held uh, in many countries which actually use them for their local currencies. Uh, if you really look at how much, how many dollars are held abroad, there's a good reason for it. You ask yourself, why does China hold a trillion dollars in US uh, Treasury bonds? And the reason is that the risk yield curve, including political risk, is very, very good for the US. And if you want to see what an attempt at common currency does, look at the euro. How much hype there was it would replace the dollar? Well, it took away uh, all uh, the monetary policy from all the other countries, and therefore Ireland and Greece and Portugal and Spain, they have their hands tied, they cannot do any monetary policy. Uh, and as for a common currency for the African Union, I think one has to think very, very carefully uh, what that means. Uh, common currencies don't just crop out of uh, by throwing a little fertilizer here or there. It takes a long, long history of global acceptance. Okay, so here's the last question for the panel. I'm going to ask Theodore to anchor it, but anyone can um, please add in. 
and that is how do the BRICS see themselves partnering or not with the United States? How does the U.S. fit into this conversation? Yeah, by the way, uh, discussion about acronyms uh, uh, reminded me that recently at, at the last summit in Beijing uh, or in, in China, uh, our gifted president invented uh, a Russian version of this acronym, which, which sounds Bryuki, which <laughs> is the translation is trousers. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, he was very happy saying that, but basically, uh, shortly, okay. people uh, ceased to use because it, it sounded somewhat yeah, different. So acronyms, uh, acronyms matter. As for United States, uh, again, for Russia, initially, it was a way to, 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 to um, associate with, with, with BRICS. Uh, uh, was a way to show that uh, if United States and Europe uh, are not ready to uh, treat Russia as an equal and important partner, then we will find uh, other partners. Now it's different because I think no one country in this grouping has serious interest to, uh, to challenge relationship <coughs> with the United States. Uh, they're very different in each, each uh, case. Uh, Brazil, uh, one kind of relationship. China, another kind of relationship. Russia, third kind. But uh, United States is extremely important to, to, to each country. I think what is uh, common to all is just to show uh, for Americans that uh, not everything in this world is America-centered. And this is, this is uh, uh, really uh, uh, an attempt to, to, uh, to see a uh, uh, world beyond American dominance, which uh, sooner or later will end. Are there other views on that? Or how should the United States think about or deal with the BRICS? Uh -huh. uh, yes, uh, I think maybe for, for the US, I think uh, there are two things. One is uh, take it easy. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, the BRICS is not uh, a block that challenged the US or the West. And also uh, we are, even among our you know, member states, we are not very sure about the future and the prospect of BRICS. So take it easy and uh, wait and see. This is first thing I think the U.S. can do. Second is talk and uh, and uh, cooperate with uh, BRICS. I think this is something the U.S. also can do. Uh, I think one thing, if we compare the U.S. and uh, Europe, I think one thing that the U.S. Uh, has done better is, uh, I think I can I can see uh, the efforts in the U.S. try to accommodate those e emerging uh, powers. Uh, including China and India and others, uh, like I, uh, the U.S. attitude uh, policy in, for instance, in IMF and World Bank reforms, and other uh, things, I think show this kind of uh, willingness uh, that U.S. I think U.S. is more ready than uh, the Europe to to accept a kind of post-America world. So I think uh, this is good for the U.S. So you should continue to do that, and I think. Uh, you cannot stop it because you cannot stop the you know those emerging countries' rights. So just uh, try to shape it and uh, cooperate with them with it. So I think this is uh, you know what I talked in my presentation that G7 and uh, the U.S. can you know have close interaction with BRICS and other countries. Then we can you know uh, together build a, a new international uh, institution and international order. Yeah, I'd I'd like to make comments. I. I think the U.S. policy has consistently been to engage China and not to contain it. Uh, the Chinese don't always feel this way, but uh, practically all the attempts made at the WTO and in the World Bank and IMF and other fora have been to bring China uh, and engage it in, in as a global power. China being what it is has been reluctant to take on those responsibilities. I think in due time, China will do so. Remember, Japan itself took a long time taking on global responsibilities. The U.S. also take a long time. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, take a long time to do what? <laughs> the U.S. took a very long time to, be, to become a global player, you know. Yes, of course, yeah. Yes. yeah. Yes. Took a, yeah. Every country do that. Yeah, it takes a long time. Uh, uh, but I, I'm saying that the U.S. emphasis vis-a-vis -vis China has been to engage China. Sure. And I think 
China has engaged the U.S. and this engagement and cooperation is increasing. Uh, I belong in the uh, National War College where we're waiting uh, to have military to military engagement and students from China. Uh, with India today, uh, there's no question that the Indian elites and uh, the Indian educated classes are very, very pro-Indian and so on throughout. Uh, apart from a very small minority of left-wing Marxist parties which uh, ha have actually lost elections uh, most recently, uh, the US is probably the most, India is probably the most pro-US country in the world today if you look at the Pew. Very different from what's going on in Pakistan. But what is different is that whereas the US sees India as a hedge against China, India is not going to play that game. India wants to keep its options open and it sees no reason why it should make itself uh, a US partner uh, against those in the US uh, who wish to hedge uh, against China. I think India and China will play an increasing role and uh, an increasingly friendly role uh, without letting the US uh, lead uh, India astray. Okay, let's open it up to the audience. Please bring us your best questions, your toughest questions, anything that's on your mind. We have five absolutely fantastic um, panelists. So let's start right here. Go ahead. I think there's a microphone right behind you. Thank you. I guess I was surprised until our friend from South Africa raised the point about the Goldman Sachs mm -hmm. origins of BRICS. I mean, who owns BRICS? BRICS is a perception mm -hmm. from outside, I isn't it? The, the multinational corporations, whether in the United States or in Europe or in Japan, that have the money that are going to be invested or have the goods that are going to be traded or the intellectual property that's going to be transferred. And I would have thought there at least would have been some consideration of the private sector view. Uh, global, government to government, multinational organizations, that's all well and good. We can talk about how the United States perceives Russia, perceives China, but in, in the end of the day, BRICS is going to be a competition for the investment dollars coming from the United States and the EU and Japan. And whether or not Russia's energy policy is better than Brazil's or whether or not uh, in, if you go to Africa or India, what kind of uh, grain or other food is going to produce. So I think that's also something that BRICS needs to consider, you know, vis-a-vis -vis each other. Are your policies those that attract foreign investors, foreign trade, WTO regulation, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just a little surprised at discussion today. I, I learned a lot. I didn't appreciate there was so much, and I appreciate the uh, new opportunities that this gives the BRICS countries and others to make opinions and to make take stances otherwise they couldn't have taken because it would be one against the, the, esta the status quo, and now it's a, a group or similar countries. The other point, and I don't want to take too much, is that BRICS somehow is exclusive. You know, mm -hmm. when you s have mm -hmm. Brazil, wh what about Mexico? And you have China, what about C South Korea? And, and Russia, what about Ukraine? <laughs> and, and do you think about, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, other, co <laughs> uh, other <laughs> countries that, you know, mm -hmm. if you will, are on the radar list of alternative choices of investment? If you want to invest in the region, and these, th these are regional, you have five different regions represented here, more or less, aren't there other players? And does BRICS highlight these alternatives, or does it maybe put a damper on them? Mm. So wha how about we start with the investment uh, in the BRIC countries? Yes, go ahead. Uh, it's a really good question uh, about the investments. Uh, I recently co-wrote a paper on uh, Brazil-China, comparing, and one of the sections of the paper is comparing the investments, uh, the uh, governance indicators in both countries, and how uh, Brazil, for, for the past uh, in the 1990s mostly and in the beginning of the 2000s, reform in Brazil was to increase transparency, uh, reduce corruption. And we look at ch comparison with China, and there's a comparison actually indicators of BRICS country comparing corruption, transparency, uh, uh, stability. And uh, Brazil has uh, one of the best indicators w of the four. Uh, I'm not sure South Africa is in the study. Uh, but China is the main uh, attractor of investment, foreign investment. So in Brazil, and that influences a, some sort of a Beijing consensus debate in Brazil. Should we do what the Chinese do to in attract investments? Uh, uh, basically, streamline uh, investments, uh, uh, stop with uh, 
f fiscalization and, and, and things of the sort. So th yes, there is uh, talk about possible competition between these countries to attract investment. Uh, as for regional rivalries, the, I believe in South America, I, I don't believe that countries such as Mexico and Argentina like BRICS, uh, like to see Brazil in BRICS. Uh, I, I'm sure that they don't. And just a quick note on, on, uh, on what was talk mentioned before about the U.S., I think it's, there's a bit of a paradox because uh, the U.S. is uh, somehow what brings these countries together, the U.S.-led order, the, uh, a, a, crit uh, a mild review of this order, but it's also, it's precisely the relations of each, bilateral relations of each country with the U.S. that also causes differences be among the, the five countries. For example, just stop on an example, the relations between Bra uh, U.S. and India uh, uh, relating to the nuclear deal. For Brazil, that was uh, very, uh, th that was not acceptable, n not officially, they didn't say anything, but uh, in 1998, Brazil ratified the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and believing that, okay, we're doing what the great powers are becoming responsible stake, uh, 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 stakeholders of the world, like uh, the, the phrase that very common here in the U.S., uh, and f 10 years later, the country that did not uh, uh, respect the proliferation regime uh, not only did not uh, uh, ratify the NPT, but gra was granted a great power status by the United States in 2008. So from a Brazilian perspective, what the United States did with India, we're supposed to be India in that case. Uh, I, that's, that's, uh, that's what's been talked in Brazil. So India was, was benefited from not uh, respecting the international rules, while Brazil did not gain anything from it. So that's just one example how uh, competition exists between among these five uh, countries. Are there other reactions to the investment question? Or I'll give I'll give a, a slight twist on that. I actually happen to be a former J.P. Morgan banker, and I'll mm -hmm. say from the investment point of view, it is a question mark uh, that does get talked about in the United States if the BRICS as an asset class to invest in the equity markets if now it's slightly overplayed. Because the markets often reward things that are not in vogue, either that they outperform and they're not yet discovered. Now the BRICS is so trendy and so hot and everybody's talking about it mm, so much, yeah. it does mm -hmm. become an investment question for U.S. dollars in the equity markets. Mm, mm -hmm. um, do, do you all have a reaction to that? That's sure. to follow on the business question. Mm -hmm. uh, BRICS is simply not a framework for that at all. Competition for investment was before BRICS, is now, and will continue after right. BRICS. Right. It's, it's not, not a question for this format. And as for exclusiveness or inclusiveness, Mexico or Ukraine, so as we heard here, uh, all BRIC country, BRICS countries uh, have so many problems already that to add to uh, Trouble producing countries uh, more. <laughs> That's maybe too early. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, do you want to respond? Yeah, I want to make a comment about uh, <coughs> um, about U.S. investments uh, in BRICS. Uh, actually, if you look at uh, any investment portfolio, you have to look at the risk. Now, China is uh, growing very fast. So you'd imagine investment in in the Chinese stock market would be something my broker would say just go ahead for. Well, it turns out that's not true because the China stock market is not transparent and we're not sure what the government rules could be. We don't know what the companies are. We don't know what the partners are. We don't have reporting rules. So my broker would say, uh, no, even if you get that return, don't invest there. By the way, the same is true of Russia. Russia's stock market has been growing, uh, but it's, uh, it, it's not transparent in the least bit. India is more transparent, but it hasn't been growing that much. So I think uh, for U.S. investors, you have to look at uh, the risk-yield ratios very much. And your stockbroker will tell you all the BRICs are not good investments all the time. Uh, you have to be, it has to be a part of your portfolio and a very carefully selected part for, of your portfolio that is particular, not stock index itself, but particular companies that you know, selected companies and uh, transparency in banking and the stock market itself is a very, very important part of how much investment flows uh, from the U.S. or Europe into these countries. Okay, other questions right here in the white shirt? Thank you. Is that working? Yes. Um, 
I, I, I'm you know, rather taken in by this uh, acronym by Mr. Jim O'Neill, uh, empty phrase, and he's caught all of you. He's caught the world. Uh, I think the Nobel Prize Committee in Sweden should give him the economics prize. After all, the Norwegians gave it to you know who for doing nothing. But I, I just want to uh, make a point that uh, this brick thing is totally out of date. It was cooked up 10 years ago. Things have changed dramatically since then. China now is the engine. The other, it's, you know, other economic groups are coming up, whether it's in Turkey or it's in uh, Indonesia. My favorite term is a chopstick zone. <laughs> From Manchuria to Indonesia, that's two billion people with a GDP of $20 trillion and a common culture somewhere. So I think we, what we have to look at is, uh, you know, what's going to happen 10 years? This brick is not a permanent thing. Nations have permanent interests, not permanent friends. So what's going to happen? Ipsa is a good example. You are the lion of South Africa. Stick to it. <laughs> not a fish to these guys. <laughs> and finally, um, you know, America, America. America is not the beltway. America is the whole thing. The institutions, the universities, the Wall Street, the industries. They are the driving force of this world. And I wish the Americans would sort of take a pride in that fact. Mm -hmm. So is uh, the BRICS concept 10 years old and out of date? Can we start there? Do we have a response? No, no one thinks <laughs> it's out of date. No, let me just say something on that. I, I think that, um, uh, that whether whether BRICS is the, 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 or the concept is out of date, I mean the fact of the matter is that you 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 have now a a forum which is called BRICS, <laughs> and I think that um, uh, now I, I agree with my Chinese colleague in the sense that I don't I do not think that BRICS should uh, should expand, but I think that BRICS's importance is that it reflects a broader. Um, uh, trend of of emerging powers, and I think we have to try to, you know, rather than getting fixated on BRICS, we have to uh, take it with a bit of a grain of salt. At the same time, realizing that that uh, there is more behind it in terms of other countries that that fall into that uh, in, in into that category, and and. Um, and become very cautious about uh, acronyms that come out of Wall Street that have a very narrow interest in terms of of uh, of, of asset maximization. And uh, uh, you know, now having said that, though, I think that when it comes around to the United States, um, the the only real strategy for the U.S. Uh, in dealing with the BRICS is essentially dialogue. I think that uh, uh, we're going through a transitional period in uh, the international system. Um, the, the, I think clearly under the Obama administration, you already have what I would call an, an, an adaptive diplomacy that is in, um, uh, that, that, uh, that is in play. Um, but I'll, and uh, what what should be of concern though is going is, is how the how different constituencies in the U.S. Um, either inhibit or promote this adaptation. For example, and this has major implications with 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 BRICS, and that is the U.S. Russian relationship. Uh, uh, if 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 hardliners in both here in Washington and in and, and in Moscow are able to, um, uh, you know, put a uh, put a break on the reset, then you've got some problems um, uh, in terms of that aspect of the adaptation. Uh, not to mention problems having to do with uh, with with uh, with with U.S. and China. Uh, the, the the other thing is that. You're dealing with more than bricks when you come into this kind of adaptation. You're dealing with uh, other acronyms like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, mm -hmm. and uh, the extent to which the U.S. can adapt its policy to engage rather than to contain 
For example, with the SCO, which, which, which I'm very much concerned about, is that the U.S. seems to want to shut the SCO out of uh, uh, the, 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 the Eurasian um, uh, 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 dynamics. And here I think that some of those within the establishment, like Zbigniew Brzezinski, who has advocated uh, last year in a foreign affairs article, advocated the need for the U.S. to begin uh, a dialogue with the SCO and, and the, um, uh, the, the, the collective security treaty organization. These are the kinds of adaptive diploma, diplomatic moves that the U.S. has got to begin to, to, uh, uh, to up-tempo on and overcome the, the, um, the resistances within the establishment to making these kinds of moves. Uh, uh, you know, so I think BRICS is, just, is simply the tip of the iceberg on, on, on this kind of thing. Okay, so I have a follow-up question from the overflow room, and you mentioned it about the SCO. How does the SCO fit into the future of the BRICS, and how does it relate to NATO? You want to answer that? Then? Just a quick comment oh, on the. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Uh, the interesting thing about international relations is that the condition of being outdated does not mean much. If you look at the UN Security Council, it is outdated, and we're still talking about it. If you look at NATO, it's still outdated, and we're still talking about it. So uh, that's a really interesting. It's a reality. Although we're, we're, uh, I'm personally a cr a criticized, I think it's limited uh, uh, possibilities of BRICS. But still, it's a political reality, and we have to face it. But the outdatedness of it does not diminish its importance. Thank you. So the SCO. Uh, yes. Um, let me say something about SCO and the BRICS. Uh, I think there are a lot of institutions which uh, consist be consist of uh, transitional countries and uh, developing countries uh, like SCO and the uh, BRICS. Uh, but I think these two, uh, first these two organizations, of course, are very uh, very different. Uh, I think BRICS, of course, uh, m uh, mainly focused on uh, global economic and uh, global political governance, mm. while SEO mainly focused on regional and uh, regional issues and uh, the issues in s in the member states, and the SEO more more focused on security issue, while uh, uh, BRICS. Uh, less on security issue, but I think uh, one thing related to uh, today's topic is you know BRICS should be an uh, open uh, forum. Uh, uh, it it should be a platform um, that not strictly uh, you know it's not a very strict organization that uh, like SCO and others. I think BRICS more or less it's an open forum for those emerging power. It's not very important uh, which five countries or six countries or seven countries are the members. I think the most important thing of BRICS is it's a forum for emerging countries, emerging uh, powers uh, to dialogue. I think this is really important. So BRICS, um, we five countries can not only sit down together and discuss, uh, and we can also have dialogues with other countries through other institutions like SCO and also for instance like the tri trilateral uh, meetings um, among China, India, Russia and uh, like South Africa, India and uh, Brazil you know this kind of many many forums and uh, many many institutions we can have uh, formal or informal uh, dialogue between them so they are not, you know, uh, two, uh, you know, very strict, tight organization. Uh, I think they are they interact like this. Yes. Mm -hmm. May I have to make a sure, comment? Sure, please. About SCO and NATO. Uh, NATO, uh, so SCO now is primarily about Afghanistan because this is a matter of huge concern for all countries in Central Eurasia. What will happen in Afghanistan after? Uh, American and NATO uh, exit, and nobody can answer. So NATO actually uh, would should be very much interested to encourage SCO to take over uh, settlement of this situation, and I think that 
SEO is the only organization actually is uh, pretty well situated to, to, to take this responsibility because uh, I don't see any other solution for Afghanistan uh, rather than a regional one because it's quite obvious that nature will not uh, win this war and nature will not settle this problem. Okay, right. Paolo, question. I agree. It's right <laughs> here in the front. Paulo Soter with the Brazil Institute here at the Wilson Center. I have two questions. Professor Singh, on the currency issue, on the reserve currency. Uh, in uh, less than two months, the United States Congress has to reach a decision on increasing the debt ceiling of this country. Uh, everybody always assumed that, that this would be done normally, <laughs> that this eventually will be done, but now, uh, Respected commentators are saying that uh, we could have a major accident and the United States could, for the first time, go into default. Uh, what happens with your, would that affect your assessment of what uh, the dollar as a reserve currency, would China ask for more uh, interest to continue to invest here? What, well, how does that uh, uh, place in the whatever emerging market uh, scenarios, the new new formats. Second question has to do with international security. Uh, we have an example recently of the BRIC countries joining, uh, I think uh, Germany joined the BRIC countries mm. to abstain from a resolution uh, authorizing use of force in Libya. Mm -hmm. Libya is sort of a case where the United States and Europe have had all positions and the opposite of all those positions in the last 30 or 40 years, so their credibility there is not very high. Uh, Brazil and others were criticized for taking that position. Now we see in the United States, even the Republican Party has joined the BRICS on, on that. Okay. Uh, so it's a completely confusing scenario, cost a lot politically, it's costing some to President Obama. Others issue of strategic importance. Brazil, Turkey, and Iran go for an attempt of bridge uh, the most difficult security uh, issue, pending issue in the agenda in May 2010. Uh, they make progress. Uh, maybe there is a problem in execution, uh, but uh, knowledgeable people uh, believe in the United States and other places in other countries that this should have been given a chance that there was mm -hmm. a space that was open and uh, the countries did not have enough uh, uh, room to make the progress that was necessary to bring Iran finally into compliance with its <coughs> obligations under the non the, the uh, NPT in this instance big stuff both Russia and China, BRIC countries, uh, saw that uh, it was more important to maintain the status quo, a status quo that is not working mm -hmm. because we are, n we are not uh, closer to a resolution of the Iranian issue <coughs> than we were, what, 16 months ago. I would like to have your comments on that. So let's start with the, the second question, security issues vis-a-vis -vis Iran and Libya. Would, would, who would like to answer that or address it? I, I could yeah, talk let a me, bit about let me it. try to. We'll let, we'll let Joao start. Go ahead. Just a, a quick note. Uh, uh, well, uh, what you mentioned, Paul, is an excellent example of how these countries differ when it comes to the specific issue. Uh, the vote on Libya was one case. The vote on Iran last year was another case. Uh, and uh, mainly that has to do with the difficult the differences between big, uh, among BRIC countries. Uh, for example, the Iranian thing, uh, Turkey and, and Brazil tried to, to, to be uh, intermediate, tried to create a, a deal to bring Iran to the table with the P5 plus one and negotiations, and uh, it didn't come through. Incompetence on one side or, or, or depending on the United States interest, we don't know for yeah, sure. But why did Russia and China did not Russia and China did not support. Uh, so there was no BRICS there, as I mentioned. In the Security Council, there is no BRICS. And f in that specific example, when you have... In Libya, there was. Yeah, in Libya, there was. I mean, of course, but, you know, 
uh, one day you have to have uh, they have to have vote the same. But uh, the c when you have a specific case of a country, for example, there's not a member of the NPT. There aren't many members, non-members of the NPT, and one of them is in BRICS, is India. Uh, that's a problem in that specific issue. Well, let me uh, uh, answer the narrow question of what happens if there's a default on the 2nd of August. Do well, think hold on. Are there any other responses to the well, security yeah. question? On the security issue, uh, yes, I, I do have a response. I think mm -hmm. what, what you don't understand, uh, the deep dynamics of this is, that if Iran actually gets a nuclear weapon, and it's certain that they have a nuclear weapon, Israel will not hesitate to bomb it out. So one of the strategic issues the U.S. faces is to prevent that outcome. Uh, and, uh, you know, regarding Libya, I mean, there's all this talk about the BRICS and this and so, but, you know, it was written by Thucydides thousands of years ago that, uh, you know, if you don't have the power, you know, the Malian dialogue, you know, uh, you know you d if you don't have the power, you do what you can. And uh, no amount uh, of uh, what, what forum is there to say there's, you know, the U.S. or the Britain or, or NATO uh, cannot attack Libya. There is no forum. And if there was a forum, who has the implements to stop it? I mean, the United Nations Security Council itself has no implementation. You, are, you know, I mean, what is it? Uh, you, would you like to start sanctions against Europe, France, uh, Germany, uh, Italy, and the U.S.? There is no international implementation mechanism, right? What act? You mean the sanctions on Iran? Are you talking about? Okay, so uh, you know, all I'm really saying is that what the U.S. does is it goes to the United Nations Security Council. Uh, if it uh, can't get the United Nations Security Council uh, to sanction its actions, it goes outside the United Nations Security Council. And then it takes uh, actions with uh, like-minded allies. Maybe, you know, they contribute one-fifteenth, and it's, you know, called like-minded allies, like in Afghanistan. Uh, but the U.S. power cannot be checked without an instrumentality. I mean, supposing you were against U.S. power, I mean, everyone has said, you know, the U.S. does all this kind of stuff, we're going to stop it. Well, go ahead, stop it. I mean, you, you, the Europeans can't even carry their own fuel into the sky. was to not help Iran have a nuclear weapon. As I understand it, was precisely the opposite, to guarantee that it will comply with its obligation and will not have a nuclear weapon. Well, you must be one of the few people, at least from that I've come in touch recently, that believes that Iran will not go for nuclear weapons. Okay, let's shift to the first question on a potential of a U.S. default. Yes, How does that impact um, well, the country? Well, let me answer that. Uh, I'm being an economist and having worked with this issue. What if there's a default? What will happen? First of all, uh, the U.S. Treasury debt uh, will be downgraded, right? Mm -hmm. Secondly, the interest rates will rise in the U.S. That means it will become more difficult for the U.S. to borrow money. Mm -hmm. And that means down the road, if, you know, if the Fed Reserve rates rise, all the other consumer loans and so on will rise in the economy. There's no other implications. Why? Because the U.S. has the capacity to print its own money. What it is doing literally through the Treasury and through the Federal Reserve is it buys and sells securities. There's an unlimited capacity to do that. And it does it by the billions of dollars every hour. It's, it's, a, it's a flow. Okay. So all it can do at the most is raise the interest rates in the U.S. economy, making it, making it I think, at a bad time because the U.S. is still at, in a recession. Uh, and if the two parties are going to be so stupid you know, to have another you know, clout on the head to a recessionary economy, Keynesians would say that they should be spending more, all right? Mm -hmm. Well, then, you know, 
I've told my broker that I'm not hedging risk, I'm hedging against stupidity of economists. <laughs> I, I mean, it's stupidity of, of politicians. Mm -hmm. If they do that, uh, they, everything will become more costly for the US. Yeah. There's no other implication. Okay, let's go right over here to the question on the side. Yes, Bill Jones from Executive Intelligence Review. I want to ask the question of uh, whether or not the BRICS is actually a break uh, on the activities on the initiative of the uh, participating countries goes back to Mr. Uh, uh, the South Africans' uh, uh, question about uh, comments on the origins of BRICS. Some people today even think that it is placed there as a break to get these countries together to form a consensus in supporting uh, the present financial system. And I, Mr. De Castro, I think pointed out in in the very beginning that uh, the issue was: Are we going to have a seat at the table, or are we going to create? a new system that works. Um, I think in each and every country there are divisions over that issue. Uh, but if the, the seat at the table is a seat on the Titanic, and it, it is looking a, a lot more like that as we proceed, uh, then some countries may want to decide, let's try and s start something new. And being in an entity of these five countries with different opinions, maybe that's not so easy to do within the BRIC, and you have to break out of it. So in that sense, the BRIC maybe becomes a break on the initiatives of these countries, especially if you have to get together with another country not in the BRIC and not an emerging economy, and I would even say in the United States itself. Although it has seemed to be the defender of the status quo, believe me, there is an enraged population and a Congress that is becoming very uneasy over these bailout policies. Uh, you can see that in the attempt to bring back the Glass-Steagall firewall between uh, investment banking and commercial banking, which is being debated as we speak. And if that happens, the United States may decide maybe we, see we need something better than this failed system and would look to other countries like China, like India, uh, to try and get together initially to form something new around which other countries uh, could operate. But if the BRIC has become kind of a straitjacket on these countries, then that would limit uh, their ability to move on that. Um, I, I think what I heard today indicates that that probably wouldn't be that straitjacket, but I, I'd like your comment on whether or not this may indeed be the case, be the, the overall overarching goal of the BRIC by the people who set it in motion, and maybe even today is used in that way by uh, the international financial elites who have an interest in each and every one of these countries. Would you like to direct that to one specific person uh, here? Well, I, I think I'd just like to lay it open because uh, I, I think it's a question of that. I mean, in all these countries, there there is this debate over what the financial system, how, do, how does, you know, China feel about it? How does India feel about this? Two countries that are probably the worst hit by this crisis, especially India, as Dr. Singh pointed out, would probably want an alternative. Would the BRIC participation be a hindrance to India moving in a direction of trying to get together with other countries to form something new, or the Chinese? No, I'm sorry I gave you that impression, actually. Uh, stop for a minute and ask yourself, a system that has worked for 70 years is not easy to reconstruct. Uh, India, on the other hand, has uh, been a very strong supporter of reforming uh, incrementally reforming the international system. Uh, both India and China believe that open flows uh, on, on capital account uh, was a wrong advice in the Washington consensus, and both India and China avoided the crisis earlier. Uh, I think both China and India are not about to throw down all the bricks and start from scratch. It takes a long time to start uh, the international system. I mean, you know, you have no idea how long it took uh, for mechanisms uh, and instrumentalities and instruments uh, to develop in the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, these are not going to be easily replaced. And where would they go if they were to start their own? Own what? I mean, take the marbles and go and play what? Would this be, uh, would this be a, what a, a BRICS IMF, a BRICS a World Bank? Uh, where would they get the capital for it? Uh, what would they do with the capital? Would they exclude other countries? Would they include other countries? I think the consensus that I see emerging, and I, I attend the October meetings uh, or with Mr. Manmohan Singh, who was my professor once, and the consensus there is, no, we want to have more leverage, 
a better voice in many of the things, for example, in WTO, uh, in, uh, you know, in global climate uh, issues. Nobody's about to overthrow the whole system. Uh, it, is, it is just too difficult. Uh, and what would you do in the transition? You know, what would you do in the transition? So, you know, before you talk about replacing the system with, you know, which has worked very, very, very well, you know, since, uh, uh, you know, 1950, uh, uh, and start something totally new from scratch, uh, you have to think about how long it took us to get here. 1947 was the WHO. Yes, 47. Fine. 1971, we could go back to that. Exchange rate, fixed exchange rates between these nations this could provide the stability no. and would lead to a uh, moratorium on much of the debt, which today is weighing down the entire system. That's yeah. what Glass Steagall's no, about. The consensus that could be done is internationally. The, the international consensus from all the economists, international economists I know, is that a fixed exchange rate is even more more devastating to the economy than variable exchange rates. The one that exists now is a trade-weighted exchange rate. And it's very easy to find out because you have the government of India uh, uh, giving a rupee to dollar exchange rate, and if that is not appropriate, there'll be a black market immediately. Uh, and I think that system has worked very well. And the gold standard, too, doesn't work. There's enough gold uh, you know, around in the world to, to back all the trade in the world. Uh, I think this is an issue which has been debated in hundreds of books and thousands and thousands of articles. Uh, and the consensus is we cannot go back to a fixed exchange rate system. Okay, other questions? Yes, right in the middle in the back there. My name's Thomas Grindley. I understand that Russia is the only country which is not a member of WTO. Is this an obstacle to cooperation? Why is Russia not a member of the WTO? Why is Russia not a member of WTO? This is a question partly to Russia, partly to the rest of WTO, because negotiations started 1993, I think. And since that, we continue and continue and continue. And every time we approach some, some final decision, uh, somebody comes with new uh, ideas what Russia should uh, open more. Uh, European Union is very eager to do that. We, we completed all dossiers uh, six years ago. Since that, every year something new, they, they remind that, oh, yes, but there's another, another issue which should be discussed. On the other hand, in Russia, frankly, there is no serious, strong political will to join. Uh, strangely enough, the main trigger of WTO membership uh, used to be uh, then-President Putin. Until 2006, approximately, he was the biggest uh, um, uh, fan of WTO, mainly for political reasons, because he thought that it's not, not, not a good idea that Russia is excluded from that club where everybody else is, is a member. Uh, but since that, he, uh, he changed his mind. And inside Russian society, both public opinion and majority of business people are not not in favor. That's some branches needs that, like steel uh, makers, for example. But the rest, uh, being uh, an economy based on hydrocarbons, and hydrocarbons is not part of WTO trade rules. It's not not an urgent need to do. As for uh, obstacles for cooperation inside BRIC, I don't think it's 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 uh, an something which 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 is discussed uh, between those countries. There are other questions? Yes, right here. Um, I'm Victor Bass, a consultant in national security policy. Uh, Ms. Wilkinson touched upon demography as a factor in. Uh, in BRICS and uh, in the world, 
I would like to amplify on that. Uh, demography is likely to be the single most powerful force in changing the distribution of world power. Mm -hmm. uh, let me give you one example. Russia has now uh, 144 million uh, population. Now by 18, uh, by uh, 2050, it will have somewhere between 77 and 96 million population, mm -hmm. which would mean that aside from the nuclear weapon, it's likely to be the least powerful member of BRIC. So <laughs> it is not, it's not why uh, Russia joined it, to be the, the least powerful m member of BRIC. So I have a question for Mr. Luc uh, Lukianov. Uh, is Putin doing something about it? As far as I know, he is not doing anything about it. But <laughs> <laughs> he does. Yeah, I was right. <laughs> okay. Speeches. But it seems to me <laughs> that Russia, in this case, can work on making BRIC something more than just a discussion club. Uh, it can, uh, for example, it needs immigration, and it can import immigration from Brazil and from India, because China is not a very useful uh, source of immigration, because China is going to have its own demographic problems. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so I have two questions uh, for you. Is the Russian government thinking about it, doing anything about it? And second, uh, do you envision the possibility that BRIC can be developed into something else than just a discussion club? Okay. Uh, as for demography, of course, the Russian government is very much aware of this uh, enormous problem. Uh, whether Russian government is doing or not, uh, Russian government is trying to do something uh, since uh, actually Putin started because prior to in, in 90s it was not at all chaotic uh, situation, nobody uh, thought uh, in the strategic terms. Putin tried to do something. The situation is slightly better now with fertility, for example, than say 10, 15 years ago. Uh, numbers you mentioned uh, are even much more gloomy and uh, than any projections. I don't know, frankly, where, where you get that, because 70, uh, 77 million, no, it's... Uh, the, 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 the no, the, uh, the UN projection, the which is very, very crude for, for Russia, is that by mid to, to 21st century, it will be around uh, 105 millions, so which, which is bad enough, but not I don't know, 77 is something completely uh, di disastrous. Uh, I don't believe in that. Uh, but uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, there are basically no uh, precedents when uh, ge uh, general demographic trends were changed. So what Russia can do, actually, to slightly improve fertility and to strongly improve situation with mortality, because our problem is that fertility in Russia is uh, as in Europe and mortality is in Africa. But, but, uh, uh, but I don't believe that we can do anything to, to, to make Russia a uh, 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 country with... Uh, uh, fertility rate as in Arab states or in Northern, or, or as in Northern Caucasus in, in the Russian Federation. Migration is an issue which, which is highly divisive in Russia as everywhere else. Uh, all economists and political scientists know that Russia will need massive migration in decades to come. The problem is that Russian population so far is absolutely unprepared to accept that fact. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that will, that will create problems like we now see in Europe, and this problem will come to, to us in a couple of years' time, I think. But uh, of course migration is the only source for Russian reproduction of population in, uh, in the 21st, 21st century. Sure, quick comment, sure. Mr. Lukianov said that we can change population trends. 
there's a project I'm working on. The biogerontologists are t telling me that in ten within 10 years, if if they obtain adequate funding, they can increase human longevity by 20 years without age-related diseases. Just think of the tremendous amount of money which this will save the United States. And uh, this would slow down the decline of population in Russia. It may not stop it, but it might stop it. Well, and I'll add one slightly irreverent thing, but didn't Russia give a day of vacation to stay home and make babies? <laughs> I read that. I read that. The BBC carried that story. Is that not uh, happened in the last? Yeah, day of vacation. Try to up the fertility rate. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that did happen, didn't it? Yeah, yeah see? Yeah. That's crazy. That yeah. did happen. <laughs> so at any rate, all right, we have um, time for a couple more questions. So... Uh, sure, right down here in front. Uh, my name is Chris Mumford. I'm with the Ballard Group. Um, I was just hoping to actually get a little more elaboration from uh, Mr. Wayne, uh, Mr. Singh, on the demographic issue. You both kind of touched on it, but I'm just wondering what your perspectives are in terms of how large the issue is going to be and, and how it might be brought to bear on the, the future of BRICS. Well, I, I agree uh, with several people in the audience that uh, demography is destiny. And it's often misunderstood. I think India, for example, uh, China is already going to peak population around about 1.35 billion. Uh, India will peak around about 1.55 billion at current projections. Uh, but it's not always good. Uh, Pakistan has 180 million people now. Uh, in another 30 years, it'll have 314 million people. And one wonders where they're going to go. Many people in the Middle East have 60 to 70 percent of their populations below the age of 25 or 30, and these youth don't have any, any jobs, many of them educated. So demography plays in many, many ways. I think of uh, geopolitically with 1.35 billion Chinese and all the Siberian wastes and resources there as to whether slowly uh, Chinese will take over uh, Russia. Uh, Nuclear weapons aren't going to stop them. These are very strong. <laughs> I'm not saying they will. No, 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 no. I know it, I'm not saying they will. All I'm really saying is that uh, those are resource-rich areas, and geopolitically, 40, 50 years down the road, one does not know. Uh, there are issues in the U.S. Uh, Europe has such demographic factors that the age-old population is growing, uh, that what is called the age dependency ratio is such, uh, that the economies can't bear the burden of, uh, of retirement. The U.S. would be the same were it not for a high rate of immigration. So I think demography is a very, very serious and important geopolitical issue and should be discussed in uh, every forum. I, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't know enough about South Africa, but I know enough about China to know that what is happening to demography is a very, very serious concern with the aging of its population, its population uh, uh, sort of aging structures are like Western Europe. Uh, Russia's aging structures uh, have, as I said, the mortality rate is very high. Uh, Brazil is, uh, you know, has a demography that is like a developing country, uh, but less so, and it's also Step, you know, it's sort of tapering to no, no additional population growth. But I think it's not just the population numbers. It's what's within it, mm -hmm. the age yeah. dependency, the number of youth. Mm -hmm. And to my p special concern in South Asia is the male to female ratio. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah. you know, this is going to play havoc in India and I think China too, mm -hmm. when men don't have enough women. In China, the bright price has already risen. In India, the dowry system will break down. Family systems will break down. Males that require homes of their own and have to live with their parents will break down. In Pakistan and Afghanistan, I mean, it's impossible to be a male and not have a household of your own. I mean, they're going to bring enormous changes <coughs> in social structures, which will have <coughs> further waves of consequences for the uh, the instabilities of these countries. So I'm a very, very strong advocate of including demographic changes and their composition within any dialogue and analysis of strategic issues. Yeah, uh, 
Go ahead, both of you on your end. Mm-hmm. Okay. Please. No, I, I just want to say briefly that I I think this is why uh, uh, a focus on on African development uh, is is so critical because with the uh, I mean a- Africa is already uh, uh, going through a uh, major demographic re- revolution. W- one of the things that I find fascinating is that about ten years ago the projection for Africa was that Africa would um, reach one billion people by 2050. (laughs) Well, Africa is one billion now and uh, is projected to be two billion by 2050. So there will be, so, so Africa will have the largest concentration of people of any region in the world. and and this has major implications if and big if there is uh, the kind of development um, of momentum that can be generated and this is why African integration is so uh, incredibly important to me uh, you know I, I personally view a lot of the policy policy discussion concerning Africa to really be very much beside the point. It, the, the, the only real priority in terms of African development is integration because the continent has the space, it has the resources, it, 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 uh, it, it has everything to give momentum to development if the focus is on integration. And this is why uh, the, uh, the Eastern and Southern African project is, 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 is so important since that's an area where there is a major, uh, a, a, a lot of the African demographic uh, uh, momentum is in that area. Uh, yes, what I want to say is just uh, uh, I, I, I completely agree with uh, Professor Sting's argument. I think this uh, issue is very, very uh, complicated. Um, population, uh, the age dependency, education, and also I think besides those, those issues also related to culture and the economy of the country. Uh, for instance, um, uh, I can give you, I can use China as an example for, for you. You know, in China, uh, different regions, different provinces have different, uh, first, ec- ec- uh, their economy structure is different. And then the, they have subcultural different regions. Mm-hmm. So in the coastal area, eastern uh, coast area, the people there they have the opportunity to develop a labor-intensive industry or manufacturing sector there, uh, either from um, their cultural tradition or from their geographic, uh, you know, location that close to 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 Hong Kong to Taiwan. So. They successfully de- developed that, but at the same time, in the uh, west, in the west part of China, uh, the population also grows. The youth, and, but they become part of the problem. So um, it's very hard to say um, the growing, uh, uh, a growing population and uh, uh, aging society is a good thing or bad thing. It well, you know, you have to judge it depend on the specific situation of. Uh, a country or even a province, a region. In, in 19, late 1970s, when, when China began its one-child policy, the birth control policy, I think at that time, everybody said, that's very good, that's good. That I think 99.9 people support that. But after 30 years, uh, we are facing an aging society. And also people found, oh, we can use those population to have labor-intensive industry, we call it uh, population dividend, oh, that's that's not a too bad thing. So th- that becomes very complicated. But on the other hand, if let's let's uh, imagine if at that time China don't in ninety seven late nineteen seventies we don't have uh, birth control policy, we have big population. Does that mean uh, you know uh, it, it can that be a part of you know useful labor? Uh, labor forces or p- part of the problem, we are not sure. And also, uh, 
uh, aging society also give you an uh, opportunity to upgrade your economic structure if you if you do it good. So I think uh, basically what I, I, I want to say is this is really complicated and we, we have to study it case by case and uh, you know country by country. Okay, so I'm going to ask the wrap-up question here and it's a forward-looking question um, about innovation. So among the BRICs, either individually or as a group, um, what are the real major innovations going forward? Are there sectors that you all are thinking about? Are there specific targets? Um, and how might you pool your ample resources together to create even better things? Uh, to anyone? M yeah, maybe I can I can say uh, something uh, in China. Maybe not not uh, you know uh, five countries together, but in China I think. Uh, there are several areas that um, we may see more and more innovations. One is, uh, of course, in the manufacturing, uh, manufacturing sector, especially those private uh, companies, private en uh, enterprises. Uh, they are, you know, um, I think they have very strong, uh, strong um, power, strong capability to do innovation, and we already saw a lot of that. And uh, another part of that is the uh, state-owned enterprises, some of them, like, uh, for instance, uh, one, one of our, uh, oh, it's not a state-owned, but it's a, it's a very big company in China, Huawei uh, Technology, it's a, you know, uh, a mobile uh, communication company. They have a lot of uh, innovation. I think they, the, uh, they have already applied many, many, uh, uh, their special technology uh, now. And uh, also Chin Chinese government invest a lot. Though maybe the effi efficiency may be lower, but still we can achieve, we can see something in like in, in the in energy sector. And also in uh, like we are, we are investing in, uh, for instance, the uh, airplane, of, uh, civil airplane, yeah. Uh, here, I mean the those important we call it, uh, critical equipment uh, of uh, China's industry. I think those issues are uh, those areas are the focus that um, both private and uh, uh, public sectors are trying to invest and uh, trying to achieve some innovation. Okay, other uh, thoughts? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead. Please go. Yeah, no, I have uh, uh, visited China many times when I was in the World Bank. One of the things that impressed me. Uh, is of course China gives special tax incentives to people who innovate. In almost every factory I visited, and I must have visited hundreds, there was always a machine room wrapped in plastic. And sooner or later, if I'd come back, it would be unwrapped. And they were looking at, you know, what it is, you know, reverse engineering. But because the incentives were so large, uh, China's uh, caught up very, very quickly in terms of its innovation. I believe that uh, China is going to be a leading uh, innovator in, uh, in green energy technologies. And I also believe that China is uh, going to be a very, very large innovator in, uh, in computer chip technologies, even though it doesn't look that way. India, on the other hand, has already taken over. It used to do telephone calls. You know, it now, you know, now produces very, very complex multiple DRAM chips. And uh, Indians are now, of course, setting up subsidiaries uh, in the U.S. Uh, to produce uh, high-technology IT software. Uh, China has already uh, produced one of the fastest uh, computers, and I think uh, India is not far behind. So I think with a billion people, uh, even if you take a much smaller proportion of people who are going to have a chance uh, to innovate, uh, you must understand, I think, China... Uh, as well as India, produce 250,000 engineers each because of the institutes uh, are there. And you will see more and more patents, more and more international journal articles, and more and more innovative technologies are coming from both countries. And Joao from Brazil? Uh, yeah. Innovation is a major challenge for Brazil, has been for a while. And the problem that we don't have enough engineers, engineers actually uh, in schools uh, to deal with that and 
and but there is some uh, efforts in uh, terms of bioenergy as well, biofuels and, and, and bioengineering in general. Uh, and but the history of Brazil with the other BRIC countries in this it's inter quite interesting. In the 1980s, uh, Brazil had a, a cooperation with China to build satellites, uh, uh, communication satellites. And uh, but since then, since 19 late 1990s and early 2000s, we've had more problems. Uh, Brazil exports to China 90 85 90 percent of Brazil exports to China are composed of three things: soy, iron ore, and oil. Uh, basically, constituting a north south or neo-colonial relationship uh, and we import manufactured goods from China and uh, Brazil's trying to add uh, to, to sell to China more uh, manufactured goods and there's uh, there's a Embraer uh, aircraft uh, uh, factory Brazil aircraft factory in China which had major problems even some related to copyright problems some say in China of uh, uh, with the state-owned enterprise there uh, Avic 1 and Avic 2 uh, and also, so that's, that has created a major problem for Brazil uh, as, d again, as seeing other BRIC countries as more, much more of competitors than partners. I see much more competition than uh, joint cooperation, joint ventures between these countries. Uh, for, for example, the China-Brazil cooperation to build aircrafts in China, Brazilian aircrafts in China, worked for about 10 years. Uh, it's not working so well. Uh, and uh, that fuels Brazil. There's a fear of deindustrialization. The, the Brazil's uh, economy, 15 or 16 percent, I think was the latest indicator, uh, 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 industry consists of 15 or 16 percent of Brazil's GDP. That's the lowest ever, uh, well, since the, after, the, co after the, the Second World War. So the, our relations with China, just to, just to keep on that, it's a sign that there's more competition than partnership between among BRIC BRICS countries when it comes to innovation. That could change, but so far for Brazil, it's not the case. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to uh, uh, briefly say that uh, now th 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 there, there is actually uh, some uh, cooperation within IBSA uh, uh, on b between the IBSA countries on uh, satellite uh, uh, a, 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 a technology uh, and a and, and a and a space cooperation in space uh, uh, around that. So I and 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 it's it's quite possible that uh, that the way IBSA operates uh, could become something to build on in terms of developing uh, uh, cooperation. On innovation, rather than um, uh, the 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 competitive uh, 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 situation, um, the w one of the things that I that that's troubling about South Africa, though, is that South Africa has not been able to um, uh, uh, to attract uh, outside investment and participation in in some of its programs. Uh, and uh, you know the the just recently, South Africa had to give up uh, on the Pebble Bid nuclear reactor, uh, which w you know th there was no 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 buy-in from that either from other BRICS countries or or um, uh, or anywhere else. Uh, so there's a and 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 there is a problem in terms of. Of um, not having enough uh, human resources, as well. So there's a there's a lot of area of cooperation that has to be built up uh, in um, you know promoting innovation, not just competitively but uh, cooperatively. Can I make a comment? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the problems uh, which uh, many countries have confronted in China is that while it has signed on on the WTO. Uh, in truth, it does not protect uh, international property rights. Uh, I remember very clearly when uh, both Boeing as well as Airbus uh, invested in China. China asked that uh, they would they, that wings must be produced in China, and they were. But it also insisted that uh, research institutes, aeronautical institutes, be set up in China to train Chinese, and they were. 
and 15 years later, of course, China's producing its own competitive planes, and there's no market uh, left for either Boeing or Airbus, except in uh, some sectors. Uh, China also has uh, made it difficult uh, to share technology, especially in the U.S. The U.S. has now become very, very concerned uh, because uh, a classical example was when I was once in Shanghai and they had put about three million CDs, right, on, on the street and were steamrolling them, you know, destroying them. And I had just visited two days earlier two factories that were producing a million CDs, you know, a day. Uh, and uh, you could buy stuff in China, you know, for almost a song. And I think uh, as part of the global order, this is another element that China uh, has to understand uh, that if it wants to be a, a trusted global player, it must abide by international practices and international rules. I know China gets a specific advantage and a step up by doing this, but in the long term, uh, who is the loser? I mean, uh, China or somebody else? I mean, uh, it, is, it is a real irritant, very, very real ir irritant uh, in terms of European and U.S. exports to China. Okay, and we will give our Russian friend the last word. Yeah, thank you. In the <laughs> in in innovation is not an area where current Russia can be very proud of. Uh, but I think uh, first, uh, it's interesting change in, in mentality in our country now uh, that we start to look for innovations not only in Europe, as we used to do before, but also in uh, other BRICS countries, especially uh, China, uh, Brazil, to, to study some experiences, India. And this is, on the one hand, it's a very positive development because Russia starts to, to, to be realistic about uh, its current situation. On the other hand, of course, it's tragic because <laughs> it means that, that uh, we are much less advanced than we used to be. And secondly, as for innovation area, I'm pretty convinced that there is one area uh, for innovation in Russia which would have uh, uh, not only economic but also psychological impact on, on development. There is energy uh, efficiency and energy saving because in Russia, being extremely rich country in terms of mineral resources, we unfortunately, uh, psychologically, we assume that resources are unlimited and, unlimited and forever. And that makes a very bad impact on, on general approach to development. And I think that uh, it starts to be understood by, by the leadership. And I hope that that might be a trigger for Russian modernization, much more than different uh, uh, beautiful games about Russian Silicon Valley outside Moscow. Okay, and to wrap up the panel, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Um, the Wilson Center is hosting these national dialogues and international dialogues, and we really appreciate seeing everyone here. Um, I'll give you a couple stats. One is in the, the past 10 years, the BRICS have contributed over a third of the world GDP growth. That's in the last 10 years. They've grown from one-sixth of the world economy to almost a quarter of the economy. And um, there are new reports out. Goldman Sachs has just put out a report that basically says the BRICS as an aggregate, as an aggregate GDP and economic power, will surpass the United States by 2018. So that's the forward look at um, what, this, th what this group means. And I would just like to thank everyone on the panel for sharing their time and their perspective and helping us understand what this means. And I know Will is, okay, that's, uh, that's a great thanks. Please help me uh, thank the panel.